they can measure 100% of women have fung fungus in their bladder. And there are things that don't cause infections. There are things that seem to be incredibly benign um, and ubiquitous, mm -hmm. and we have no idea what they're doing. found in the male and female blood are different or are there similarities? In general, they're very different. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking about, there's the connection between the vagina and the bladder in the women because the urethra is very small compared to the male mm -hmm. urethra. Uh, so lactobacillus is the dominant organism in the uh, female bladder, whereas you have streptococcus and staphylococcus tend to be the dominant organism in the male bladder but very little research has been done in the male bladder compared to female. So okay. we only have small snapshots. Right. And um, have you seen evidence that viruses and fungi could also be like part of the normal healthy bladder microbiome? Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's really interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a, a microbiome, fungal mm -hmm. microbiome, um, that is being looked at. Apparently, it is quite diverse and um, actually kind of surprising. It seems like unlike uh, bacteria where we can measure maybe like 75 to 50% of women, we can measure their bacteria in their bladder. Mm -hmm. They can measure 100% of women have fung fungus in their bladder. And there are things that don't cause infections. There are things that seem to be incredibly benign. Um, in ubiquitous mm -hmm. and we have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know um, any work that's been done on how they, the microbiome might be changing the immune system or causing symptoms. Um, it is very, very early days there. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to viruses, again, yes, there are both eukaryotic and prokaryotic viruses. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> um, uh, when a scientist says eukaryotic, they're most likely talking about everything in the visible world. So plants, animals, um, even fungus. Mm -hmm. uh, prokaryotic are all the single celled organisms. That's a simplified explanation, but for this, these purposes, it'll work. Okay. Um, so bacteria are prokaryotes. And so I guess what I'm saying is that there are, in the bladder, there are viruses that infect humans and there are viruses that infect bacteria. Mm -hmm. And those are really, really cool. Um, they're called bacteriophages or phages mm -hmm. uh, for short. And um, <clears throat> phages are, exist everywhere that bacteria exists. They have been around as long as bacteria have. And bacteria and viruses have been in an arms race for the entire evolution. Um, and why, I, why that's so fascinating is bacteria and viruses replicate a lot faster than humans. So think mm -hmm. about how many generations of humans have been on the planet, maybe multiply that by 10,000, maybe more. I haven't done the math. Um, and that's how long <laughs> these organisms have been at war with each other. So there's these really complex, interesting interactions about how uh, bacteria protect themselves against phages and then how phages mm -hmm. get around that protection and are still able to, to kill the bacteria. Um, and the bacteria have their own immune systems. I love this stuff. I think it's so cool. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons that you'll probably hear the term phage is in phage therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I have high hopes for phage therapy, but I'm also very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. um, the, the high hopes is that phages are very specific. They can kill off one strain of bacteria like a specific kind of E. coli that can target that and just kill that and leave every, the rest of the microbiome completely unaffected. Um, and they can do it over and over and over again. The, that's why I'm optimistic. I'm pessimistic because bacteria have always evolved ways to come back right. at, to get around it, right? And, um, and phages have a very complex relationship where sometimes, like depending on the phage, they'll just hang out inside the bacterial genome and wait, mm -hmm. you know, and then they'll, then they'll lice and under certain conditions, they'll come out. And so um, 
phage therapy was was really big in the pre-antibiotic era. They thought that was going to be the way we you know, cured all these diseases. Mm -hmm. And it never took hold because we didn't identify all of these different ways that E. coli or, or other bacteria can protect themselves. Um, one of the biggest ones that we recently discovered was CRISPR-Cas, which you mm -hmm. know about for gene editing. Um, that is a bacterial mechanism to protect itself against phage. And we discovered that in 2000 something. Okay. So there's a lot more yet to be discovered that we know so little about um, how these two things have been interacting. Um, so there's some really interest, on the one hand, there's some really interesting work where the people can take a sample, isolate the phage and then you know propagate the phage and use that to treat the same person. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really cool research being done there. Um, I just wonder how many times you can do that for one individual or how you can scale that up so that you can yeah. use the same phage for multiple individuals. And that's the, that's the section that I'm a little um, pessimistic about. And difficult to get FDA approval, I imagine, given each phage is totally different to the last, exactly. depending on the situation. I, I hope that someone smarter than me has figured out, you know, <laughs> how to do this or will soon. It'll be I a heard that about most things. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen any research that maps different organisms to certain sets of symptoms? Um, people have tried. Um, and it is uh, challenging for a couple of reasons. Um, the first part is that a lot of urinary disorders are grouped kind of haphazardly. Mm -hmm. So for example, urinary incontinence is characterized by frequency, urgency, and nocturia. UTIs are characterized by frequency, urgency, nocturia, pain, and sometimes blood. Mm -hmm. So who's to say that someone who is diagnosed with UTI doesn't actually have, or sorry, diagnosed with UUI doesn't actually have a UTI mm -hmm. without pain. Right. Um, and so you get these studies which, which are trying to group patients based on their symptoms. So you have a study just about incontinence or UUI. Mm -hmm. How many of those patients actually had a UTI? We don't know. Right. And you have another study that's just about UTIs. Maybe one of those was more of a UUI and, and we don't know. Um, so there's, it just ends up being this messiness in the data that's right. hard to tease apart. Um, also, we're learning again from the gut microbiota that certain bacteria, it's not, symptoms aren't caused by just one bacteria. Mm -hmm. Symptoms can be caused by a wide variety of bacteria. So um, maybe E. coli and pseudomonas cause one set of symptoms and E. coli and something else cause another set of symptoms. So again, what does E. coli cause? We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The third confounding factor there is it has a lot to do with the host. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the, um, the host's history. So there's a lot of research in UTIs trying to understand recurrence, which I know is a, a huge issue. And there's some evidence that shows people who have had one UTI um, are, their epithelium is more likely to get infected upon subsequent exposure. Mm -hmm. So if E. coli comes back, it's a faster, um, breakout of an, of an infection. Mm -hmm. um, that has nothing to necessarily do with the E. coli. That's entirely on the host side. So do again, is E. coli why that it? Um, No, not entirely. Uh, but I kind of think of it like having scar tissue. Um, mm -hmm. And you need to have the, the other feeling completely recover before it gets attacked again. Otherwise, the scar tissue just keeps getting thicker and thicker in this case, the immune system just keeps getting more primed and ready mm -hmm. to, to infect. There's some really good research trying to figure this out right now. Okay. And I feel like as far as UTIs go, that's probably the um, the E. coli recurrent UTI infection model is probably the most developed one. Okay. Um, so that probably has the most hope. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out for the answer then, because it is very interesting. And I have read that, but I'm, I just don't understand the mechanism behind it yet. Yeah, I think because we don't understand it yet that's, either. That's good then. <laughs> I didn't miss More it. More research is needed, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, so are there certain organisms that are more likely to cause an upper urinary tract infection as opposed to a lower urinary tract infection? I don't think so. I have never heard of that uh, dichotomy, mm -hmm. um, but there might be some people in like the kidney stone world that would question that. Mm -hmm. And I can um, imagine, I can imagine that there would be, even though I haven't heard of it. So um, again, if you just think of the anatomy, you have the urethra, the bladder, the ureters and the kidneys, right? Mm -hmm. And so for a bacteria to go all the way up that distance, that would be like us walking the entire length of California, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna take some time mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to be fairly energetic and you're gonna have to have food and water and all these things prepped and ready to go. And it's the same thing for bacteria. Some bacteria have very robust um, motility genes. Um, mm -hmm. They're able to hold on to the wall with, due to shear forces, because again, you have liquid flowing through these spaces. Right. So um, you think about that environment, it might be the attachment mechanism, it might be the motility mechanisms, it might be their ability to um, sense whatever it is they're swimming towards, um, yeah. right? We don't know what that is either. <laughs> Why did they go all the, that way? Yeah, it's creepy, really. <laughs> Just because? I don't think so. Um, so we we don't know, but I could imagine that there there would be. Let's move on to hormones and because okay. you've written an article for our site on that link before. So I thought we could take some questions on that. Um, is there any research that you've seen that is about the connection between changes in hormonal birth control and the onset of recurrent UTIs? No, but I wish there was. <laughs> um, one of the big gaps, uh, actually, oh, I don't really know where to start here, but one of the big gaps in the literature, the way I understand it is that um, there isn't very good measurements of hormone levels, circulating hormone levels in women overall. Like we mm -hmm. have this very broad range. You fall somewhere within here, um, but that's actually really hard to pin down. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried looking in literature for it and I've found very different things. Um, we don't know what that range is throughout a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that range is when you're on birth control or you're not. Um, we don't know what that range is if you have endometriosis versus not, right? Like, it doesn't seem like anyone's looking at the hormone, circulating hormone it's levels. Kind of unbelievable, really. Right? Mm -hmm. um, that's why I don't necessarily, I, I feel like it should be out there. I just mm -hmm. haven't been able to find it yet. Um, but I haven't found it yet. So I if, anyone found listening, it <laughs> if anyone listening knows where that paper is, please send it to me. Yes, um, definitely. Uh, but there's definitely never been any um, measurements of the of different estrogen or progesterone during um, a UTIs. I have not been able to find that. Okay. So, but we do know just from diagnostic history that changes in hormones result in a whole slew of changes throughout your your mm -hmm. body. We can change. Your, it can change your immune system. Therefore, it's probably also changing your microbiota, um, but we do not understand that in one bit. Okay. Interesting factoid though, uh, your gut microbiome can produce hormones, which I thought was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Do you have yeah. more information on that? Not much, no. We just know that it, <laughs> that it can produce it. So more um, research is needed. No more research is needed, yeah. Right, I see, I see. Um, do the bladder and the vaginal microbiomes change with age? Do we know that? We do know that. Okay. Uh, so there, um, there's a connection between estrogen levels and, and I say estrogen levels in a very broad sense of the term, between estrogen levels and the composition of your microbiota. Mm -hmm. So premenopausal women, women of reproductive age, have a very a high lactobacillus content in their vagina, and we see that also in the bladder. When you reach menopause, you lose the estrogen. The thought is you lose um, a food source of the lactobacillus that causes it to go down in the total amounts mm -hmm. and other things come in to colonize. And you get a much more diverse microbiota, both in the vagina and the bladder when the lack of estrogen. And this can all be reversed if you provide estrogen back into the system, whether orally or locally. Mm -hmm. um, we know that in the vagina, you actually do get a um, return to lactobacillus dominant phenotype 
for postmenopausal women who have been on estrogen replacement therapy. Okay. I'll share a link to the article that you wrote on this too, so people can get more information and read some of the studies around it. Um, do you know if the urinary microbiome changes during pregnancy? We have only looked at a couple different populations and unfortunately they were all hospitalized at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit skewed because they were in the hospital for some reason. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a normal pregnancy. But we do know for the gut microbiome field and the vaginal microbiome field that it changes dramatically throughout pregnancy. Okay. Um, and they think it is it has to do with hormone levels. Again, vague concept, no actual mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. um, and also nutritional requirements of the growing fetus. So your gut microbiome changes to try and get more nutrients out, mm -hmm. and your vaginal microbiome changes to. Um, they think to help prevent infections, but also um, just in response to hormone changes. With pregnancy, guidelines suggest that you treat asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, but now that we know that the bladder isn't sterile, do you think those guidelines should actually be reviewed? Um, I would like them to be reviewed, but I don't think that the recommendations will change. Mm -hmm. The because again, because more research is needed, again, <laughs> broken record there. Um, <laughs> um, so with E. coli, there have been studies of um, UPEC, uropathogenic E. coli, strains we know that cause infection, compared to ones that they call asymptomatic bacteria or ASB. Mm -hmm. um, and these are in non-pregnant individuals, but they've looked at all of these uh, strains that were collected from people with symptoms or without, and they did this massive genetic comparison mm -hmm. and they found no difference. Mm -hmm. um, so at the genetic level, there is no difference between these strains, okay. which suggests that it has something to do with the bacteria's response to the environment, AKA the host. Mm -hmm. um, something is causing the bacteria to switch on certain genes and switch off certain genes and all of a sudden become pathogenic. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the concept around ASB in pregnancy. Right. If you have a high enough content of E. coli there, and we already know that there's lots of things happening in pregnancy that's going to cause changes, there's a higher probability that you're going to get infection and infection can have really terrible consequences for the fetus. Right. Um, so until we can actually say what ASB really is, until we can define what is a safe ASB versus non, I don't think the guidelines are going to change. Um, also kind of wrapped up into that is the, um, the low risk tolerance of ob community in general. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to doing experiments or trying uh, state-of-the-art techniques um, that aren't 100% proven with clinical trials, they're just not going to, to take up something like that because the risk that something goes wrong and you lose a baby, yeah, it's that's, that's huge. Um, so they're actually, they tend to be very, very cautious in a lot of things. And this, this goes with all the pregnancy stuff. Mm -hmm. like, yes, you can have one cup of coffee, but then the OBs are saying, no, don't have any coffee because right. we don't know what level is safe. It's yeah. the same kind of thing.